Hello, hello, how are we doing today? I'm so excited. We're gonna be watching a Mr. Ballin video. Boy thought he saw a ghost. The truth is much worse. So I hope you're ready. I say, let's just get straight into it. In 1998, a young boy saw something terrifying out of a window in his house in the middle of the night. But after telling his mom about it, she looked around, didn't see anything, and so told him, you know what? You probably just imagined it. However, years later, that boy and his mother would learn he had not just imagined it. It was very real. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once or twice every week. I'm so excited. if that's of interest to you, please spend a nice long day at the beach, and then afterwards make a special trip to the Like Button's house so you can shake out your towels directly into one of their open windows. Also, please subscribe <laughs> to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's Let's story. do this. I'm so excited. It's been a hot minute since we've watched a spooky Mr. Ballin video. Cranbrook, which is a small snowy town in British Columbia, Canada, used to be a place no one had heard of. Then Isaiah Otieno changed that. In 2006, an 18 year old smiling young man named Isaiah Otieno stepped off of a plane in Cranbrook and began making his way toward the baggage claim. As he walked, everyone in the airport stopped and stared up at him. Isaiah was six foot nine inches tall, Shut. and he was from Kenya, making him easily one of the most unique people in all of Cranbrook. It's Isaiah, tall. who was the son of a Kenyan politician, had worked really hard to earn his slot at the local university called the College of the Rockies. His plan was to use that degree to get a great job so he could help support his family back in Nairobi. Not long after the first semester of Isaiah's freshman year had started, he was not only flourishing academically, but also socially. His big smile and his charm and his incredibly good manners had earned him many friends as well as the nickname, The Gentle Giant. But the person Isaiah most closely bonded with while he was in Cranbrook was another student named Isaac Hockley. Isaac, in addition to being a student at the College of the Rockies, was also a passionate photographer and actually worked part-time for the local newspaper as a freelance photographer. Isaac and Isaiah had briefly met in late 2006 at their campus's billiard halls when they were both playing pool, but that interaction had not made them friends. What had cemented their friendship and made them very, very close was one night in early 2007, Isaiah had gotten a job as a bouncer at a local bar because he's six foot nine, and so he was the bouncer, and Isaac had come to that bar, not to see Isaiah, just to go to the bar, and so Isaiah's at the okay. front, he's checking people in, and then he hears this commotion in the bar behind him, and he turns and he sees Isaac is getting attacked by this huge guy that's way stronger than him, who looked like he yeah. was the aggressor in the fight. And so without any hesitation, Isaiah turns and just starts galloping into the bar. He's leaping over chairs, he's leaping over tables, and he jumps into the fray and he fought off Isaac's attacker. And so after the dust settled, Isaac was so thankful for Isaiah, even though Isaiah kind of downplayed so it nice. and acted like it was no big deal. But either way, the experience totally bonded these two very different people. And after that, they became totally inseparable. Over the next couple of semesters, the pair would often go off on long rides outside of Cranbrook into the mountains and the forests, and they would just chat. Isaiah would talk about what it was like we to We all know in what Kenya happens in the mountains. And how he was really here to try to be successful like his father. And Isaac would talk to Isaiah about his passion for photography and what it was like growing up in Canada around Cranbrook. On one very memorable drive, the pair were driving at night along this kind of winding road that went through a forest when all of a sudden a moose leapt onto the road and blocked their way. And so Isaac at the last second had to swerve to avoid the moose. But ultimately they did not get into an accident and it was just a close call. So Isaac was totally fine. He had kind of recovered within seconds of getting past the moose. But Isaiah, who was in the passenger seat, was totally shaken up by it. And when Isaac started talking to Isaiah about why he was so shaken up because after all they are fine they did not get into an accident Isaiah would admit that he wasn't shaken up because they almost got into an accident he was shaken up because he saw a moose he didn't know moose existed and so seeing oh, this enormous creature, so cute, man. that's what she said <laughs> oh 
suddenly in the middle of the road right in front of them just had totally spooked him. And so after this, Isaac loved to bring this story up as a way of kind of making fun of Isaiah for his fear of moose, but it was totally in a loving way, and Isaiah would always laugh right along with him. But despite how well everything was going in both Isaiah and Isaac's lives to that point, everything would come crashing down in 2008. On May 13th, 2008, oh, no. so two years after Isaiah showed up in Canada, Isaac got a phone call from his employer, the local newspaper, who told him he needed to head into town to take some pictures of a crash that had just happened. A helicopter had been flying over Cranbrook conducting a power line survey when they had lost power oh, and no. crashed. And all three people, the pilot and the two people in back who were actually doing the survey, they all died on impact. Isaac, like everybody else who heard about this, was totally shocked. One, because it was totally tragic and horrible, but two, because nothing ever happened in Cranbrook. So to have something so big like this happen right downtown was just unheard of. And so Isaac hopped in his car and he began making his way towards the crash site. And it didn't take long before he saw this massive ring of people right at the intersection between 10th and 14th Street. They were all on the sidewalk and up on buildings and everyone's just looking in towards this massive mound of jagged metal that was on fire and all this black smoke was coming off of it. And there's ambulances nearby and police and the fire department was there and they're trying to put out the flames, but they can't do it. And so Isaac parks his car and he rushes over to this ring of people and he works his way towards the front. He pulls out his camera and he began taking pictures first of the wreckage and the fire and then also of the police as they put tarps over the bodies. Little did Isaac know oh, no. these pictures he was taking were about to take on a whole new significance for him. Earlier that day, just before 1 p.m., Isaiah wrapped up his final class of the day and after he was done, he remembered he had some letters in his backpack that he had been meaning to mail to his family back in Kenya. And so he decided on his way home, he would make a detour to the post office and he would mail those letters. And so he left the building where this final class was and he stepped out into the bright sunshine of that May day. He put his headphones on and then he began to walk. At about 1.05 p.m., he arrived at the post office and he went inside just long enough to put his letters in the mail slot and then he headed back outside. One minute later, at 1.06 p.m., as he was crossing oh, no. 10th Street, the helicopter above lost power and crashed directly on top of uh. Isaiah. Within seconds, he and the three people on board the helicopter would all be dead. It's believed because Isaiah was listening to music on his headphones, he didn't even hear the helicopter as it was crashing down. He was just oh, walking shit. and then he was dead. It was a total freak accident. It wasn't until later that day that Isaac would realize the pictures he had taken of this scene included pictures of his friend. Stripes. On a warm summer night in 1998, a seven-year-old boy named Tyler Florian fell asleep watching TV on his oh, living room couch. Tyler lived with one. his parents as well as his older brother, Will, who was 10 years old in a modest two-story home in a rural neighborhood in West Virginia. That night, West Tyler's Virginia. father, who normally tucked the boys in at night, was out for work. And so after Tyler fell asleep, it was his mother who gently woke him up and encouraged him to head upstairs to his room. And so Tyler, he gets off the couch and he's groggy and he makes his way over to the stairs. He climbs up the stairs and he turns right and heads down the hallway to his room. He goes into his bedroom, he climbs into his bed, and then he falls asleep. In order to understand what happens next, you need to have a good understanding of the layout, the layout. of the second floor hallway. I like how he like that hallway gives stretched you a little from the front of the house all the way to the back of the house. And at either end of this hallway were doors that led outside of the house, and these doors had big windows on them. The front of the house, that door, if you walked out it, you'd be walking out onto a balcony that overlooked the front yard of the property. But if you walked out the back door of the second floor hallway, you would not be walking onto a balcony. You would not even be on the second floor. You'd be basically stepping into the backyard of the house. And the reason for oh, this okay. is because the house was built into a hill. And oh, so yeah. the back half of the house is literally underground. It's in the hill. And so there is no door on the lower half of the house because there's just earth behind right. the door. And so it's that second floor doorway at the end of the hall that serves as kind of like the exit to the backyard of the house. So with that in mind, Tyler, he gets upstairs, he goes to his bedroom, which is towards the front half of this hallway, and he falls asleep. 
and then only about an hour after falling asleep, he wakes up to the sound of someone using the bathroom. Tyler's bedroom was positioned right across the hall from the bathroom, and his door was open, and so Tyler's laying on his bed, he opens his eyes, mm. and he's looking through his open door at the bathroom, and the bathroom, the door is shut, but he can see there's light coming out from underneath the bottom of the door, so he knows someone's in there, and so Tyler's just laying there watching whoever is in there. He's assuming it's his brother, who has a habit of going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, and so he's just kind of watching, and then at some point, he hears the flick of the light as it's turned off, and he sees the light disappear from inside of the bathroom the door swings open and sure enough it's his brother who steps back into the hallway his brother <sighs> looks into okay. tyler's room but doesn't attempt to interact with tyler instead will just turns and walks back down the hallway towards his bedroom and so as tyler is listening to the sound of his brother's footsteps fade down the hallway he closes his eyes again and prepares to go back to sleep but as he's laying there with his eyes closed, he can tell that his brother has stopped short of his bedroom and has turned around and is now walking back up the hallway towards the bathroom and towards Tyler's room. And so Tyler opens his eyes again because he knows his brother is about to be right in front of his bedroom. And he's thinking, OK, you know, maybe he forgot something in the bathroom. And so Tyler to decides the to just watch to see what his brother does. Sorry. And so sure enough, Will walks all the way up until he's standing right in front of Tyler's open door. But instead of going into the bathroom, Will walks into Tyler's room. And right away, Tyler sits up and says, you know, hey, what are you doing? What's going on? And his brother, he pauses for a second and he begins to say something that sounds like he saw something out there. But, you know, he's hesitant. He doesn't really know how he wants to frame the thing he wants to say. And so Tyler's like, come on, what are you what? doing? It's the middle of the night. What's going on? And finally, Will just blurts out, I, I keep seeing a man wearing stripes at the end of the hallway. And so Tyler, he hears this and he can't compute what he's being told. And so he just says, what? What are you talking about, Will? What did you see in the hallway? And Will would say again, I keep seeing a man wearing stripes at the end of the hallway. I've seen him a couple times in the last couple like of days. Inside or outside? I go to the bathroom and then when I start walking back, I see him outside the back door in our backyard. Oh, okay. And so Tyler is so scared because his brother outside. does not sound like he's making a joke. His brother sounds like he's telling the truth and just the fact that his brother can't quite find the words to describe what he saw made it seem even more real. And so Tyler, he gets out of bed and he says, Will, we got to go tell mom. But that yeah. required going into the hallway and going down the hall towards where apparently this man in stripes was to get to their mother's bedroom. To and so past. Will, who initially was not that scared of this man in stripes he had seen, was now starting to get pretty panicked in seeing Tyler's reaction to this. And so Will tells Tyler, you know, stay right there, stay in the room. And so Will, he kind of peeks back into the hallway and he looks all the way down and there is no man in stripes anymore. There's no one in the oh. hall. And so he tells Tyler, you know, the coast is clear and the two of them run down the hallway all the way right in front of that door that leads into the back of the property where the man in stripes yeah. was and they turn left and they go into their parents bedroom where just their mother was because their father was out of town and so they charge in there they wake their mom up and they're talking over each other trying to communicate to their mom that there was a ghost that there was an intruder that there was something bad happening around their house and so finally their mom just tells them to be quiet and she says okay boys sit on the bed I'm gonna go have a look around the house and so the two boys do as they're told. They sit on the bed and their mom leaves the bedroom. She goes into the hallway and she looks immediately to her left where the man in stripes supposedly was. And she doesn't see anything. She just looks out into their backyard. There's nothing there. She looks down the other direction out the front of the house. Doesn't see anything. She walks all around the house. She goes outside. She looks everywhere, but she doesn't she see anyone outside. or anything. And so eventually she comes back inside the house. She goes up to the second floor. She goes back to her bedroom and she tells her boys, look, you probably just spooked yourselves. There is no man in stripes. You're totally safe. You're totally fine. Just go back to bed. You probably just imagined whatever you saw. And so Will, who was the one who saw the man in stripes, was very quick to accept his mother's answer. It actually seemed like it was a relief to have somebody tell him that what you had seen wasn't real. And so he very happily went back to his bed and he fell asleep. But Tyler, who had not seen the man in stripes, but had a very intense reaction to hearing his brother describe it, could not accept his mother's answer. It just totally freaked him out because his brother was always joking around about stuff, but this did not feel like a joke. This felt very, very real. But over the course of the next couple of days, weeks, months, years, Will never claimed to see the man in stripes again. And so pretty quickly, 
Tyler forgot about it. Hmm. Fast forward 11 years to 2009, so Tyler is now 18 years old, and he and his mom were out in the car running some errands. And as they're driving around, they were just chatting about all sorts of different things, and at some point, they began talking about one of their beloved family pets, a dog named Max that they had when Tyler was really young. And so as they're kind of swapping stories about all the goofy things that this dog did, Tyler's mom suddenly says, hey, Tyler, do you remember the time that I opened the front door to let the cops into the house? And Max came bounding into the house, and he went right into the kitchen, and he ripped open all the food. And Tyler's looking at his mom like, wait, when did the cops come to our house? When did you open the door to let the cops come into our house? And as soon as Tyler said this to his mom, his mom looked at him as if she had just given away something she hadn't meant to. And then she kind of relaxed oh. and said, you know what? I never got around to telling you. Now that I'm thinking about it, you and your brother were asleep and you didn't even know this happened. And then afterward, oh, me shit. and your father decided not to tell you guys because we didn't want to scare you. Back when you were about seven years old and Will was about 10 years old, your dad was away at work and we were all asleep one night when suddenly I wake up to the sound of someone or something moving around outside of our house. And so I sit up in bed and I go into the hallway and I look left and I look out that door into our backyard and I see standing up against the glass, oh. this man with his hands pressed to the window looking into the house. And so Tyler's mom would tell him how she totally freaked out and she flipped on the lights and it scared this guy who ran off. And then she called the police and then the police showed up and that's when their dog Max came bounding inside and shredded the bag of food and the police, they searched the property, but apparently they never found this guy. Tyler's mom would go on to tell him that the police warned her that her description of this man that was standing at their back door matched the description of a man who was wanted for murder who was on the loose in the area. Tyler was Are you serious? He didn't remember this because obviously he had been asleep because this is something he would have remembered. And so he had so many yeah. questions about this whole situation. But the first question he asked his mom was, well, what did he look like? And his mom said, well, you know, he was tall, he had dark hair, he had blue jeans on, and oh, you know what? He had a striped shirt on. Stripe. It would turn out for a couple of days in the summer of 1998, this suspected murderer who was on the run from police had apparently been hiding out on Tyler's family's property. And in the middle of the night, for whatever reason, this suspected murderer would walk over to the back door of the second floor hallway, and he would put his face up to the glass and he would stare Why? into their home. This was the man in oh, stripes that shit. Will claimed to have seen. He Hello. was real. Tyler, after making this connection, would follow up with his family members and he would do some digging of his own, but he was never able to figure out who the man in stripes was or what happened to him. In 2012, a 22-year-old woman named Simone was living in a small winemaking village called Rudesam am Rhein, which is located in southwestern Germany. This village is strikingly beautiful. It's full oh, of so quaint pretty. European homes, and there's lots of rolling green hills with vineyards as far as the eye can see, and the village sits right on the banks of the Rhine River. Simone had grown up in this picturesque village, and she had loved it, but this was gonna be her last summer before she left and headed off to New York City to start the next chapter of her life. And while she was excited about that, she was also kind of sad because this village and everybody inside of it were the only things she had ever known. And so the idea of leaving them behind just seemed very strange to her. But instead of focusing on the kind of growing anxiety around her imminent departure from Germany, she focused on what she would be doing that summer while she was still in Germany. Some of Simone's fondest memories of her childhood were of her time spent at summer camp. And the summer camp was located in this forest that was not far from her village. And every summer in July, Simone, along with about 200 other kids from her village and from neighboring villages, would converge on the campgrounds in the forest for two weeks of oh, that's a lot of kids. And going on scavenger hunts and putting on stage plays and just generally having a really good time. But when Simone became a teenager and was too old to be a camp attendee, she decided she would volunteer and be a camp counselor. And she found it was awesome. She immediately connected with the other camp counselors and she felt all grown up having a real job and she loved goofing around with all of the kids. And so every summer since that first time volunteering, Simone had gone back and volunteered again. And this summer was no different. 
So in mid-July of that year, Simone packed up her things and she headed off to the forest. The way this camp worked was the 200 plus kids that were attending the camp, they would get dropped off in the mornings each day by their parents and they'd play and run around all day. And then in the late afternoon, their parents would come back and pick them up. So none of the kids were sleeping over oh, so it's like a day during these two weeks. However, like the camp. 30 plus counselors, they would just stay at the camp for the full two weeks. They would just sleep in tents out in the forest. Technically, right. the reason they did this was to make sure they had enough time in the morning to prep the campgrounds for the kids, and then also in the evenings to have enough time to clean up and kind of have it ready for the next day. But in reality, Simone and the other counselors all knew that the camping out in the forest was the best part of the volunteer experience. After all the kids went home for the night, all of the counselors would finish up They're all of their drunk. duties and then rush off into the forest where their tents were and where there was a fire pit, and they would have some beers and wine because the legal drinking age in Germany is actually 16. So all these counselors counselors are having a couple of drinks and then before long they'd be 16? laughing and telling stories and just generally having a great time. So that July Shit. in 2012, Simone and the other counselors arrived at the campgrounds a day early and they caught up with each other and they prepared the campground. And then the next morning, all the kids showed up and everything went off without a hitch. And then that afternoon, after all the kids had been picked up by their parents, Simone and the other counselors rushed to finish up all their duties and then headed off into the woods to enjoy their first night hanging out together. After a couple of beers had been passed around the campfire, everybody was in good spirits and laughing and telling stories but pretty quickly people started to fade and get tired because you know it was their first day back at camp and it had been a long tiring day and so people very gradually began retiring to their tents to go to bed and eventually Simone too had crawled into her tent and gotten onto her cot to try to sleep herself but she found that night it was so hot she couldn't be in her tent it was stifling inside of there and so she decides she's just gonna sleep out in the open where it's a little bit cooler and so she picks up her fold-up cot and she brings it out into the open and she sees there are several other counselors who have done the same thing. And so she puts her cot down next to one of her good friends who's already asleep in her cot. And then Simone climbs into her cot, she gets under her covers, and she tries to fall asleep. But for the next hour, Simone just tosses and turns, she can't get comfortable. And by that time, everybody else has completely passed out. So it's just her, you know, she's counting down the oh, time lucky until she for has them. to get up again to start the next day. And so she's getting stressed about that. But eventually she would yeah. fall asleep. However, she would immediately be thrust into one of the most visceral and intense nightmares she had ever had in her entire oh. life. In her dream, she opens her eyes and she looks out in front of her and it's this desert city and there are hundreds of people all in front of her just standing there looking up at her. And then she notices on her left and on her right are these two men, these big huge men that are both working on something behind her. She doesn't really know what it is, but they're obviously busy doing something and she kind of glances up at one of them and she notices he's holding something that looks like a wreath, like a holiday wreath you would hang on your door. And so Simone looks away from the guy with the wreath and just looks back out at this huge sea of people, which is totally bizarre because no one's moving, no one's making any sound, they're just staring at her. And then she feels this shooting pain in the top of her head. The man who was standing on her right was not holding a holiday wreath. He was holding a crown of thorns. And now he, along with the oh guy on the other side of her, were working together to press this crown of thorns into her head. And so Simone is feeling the thorns being pressed deeper and deeper into her scalp. And she tries to fight them off, but she realizes she can't move. She can't even turn her head to look at them. She can only see them out of her periphery vision. And then she tries to scream out for help to someone in the crowd to come help her. But when she opens her mouth, no sound comes out. And so as she's sitting there, all she can do is stare straight oh, out ahead of weird, her man. as the pressure of these thorns are driven deeper and deeper into her skin. And oh. then at some point, blood begins dripping down in front of her eyes. And around that point, the pain became so blinding, so awful that it woke her up. And as soon as she woke up, she shot up and she reached for her head to make sure there was no crown of thorns on her. And as she's doing that, she's thinking, okay, phew, yeah. it was just a dream. That was just a horrible dream. I'm in this forest, I'm good, I'm safe. And as she's kind of patting on her head, she's realizing her head is wet. 
And as she's touching her head, she's realizing it hurts. There's a stinging pain in her head. And then she realizes it's not just a stinging pain. It's a throbbing, intense pain all over her head. And so as she's kind of having this realization that her dream is now kind of segued into her real life, she looks out ahead of her and she sees off in the distance in the tree line, something is running through the woods. She can't tell who or what it is, but she makes a mental note that there is something, someone running away from them. But this pain in her head has gotten so intense that she can't focus on anything else. She can only focus on the pain. And as she's thinking about how much her head hurts, she screams in pain. And the girl who was laying next to her that had been asleep, she wakes up to the sound of the scream. But it's totally pitch black. She has no idea what's going on with Simone. And so this girl, she sits up and she's trying to get Simone to tell her what's going on. But Simone has no idea. She's totally frantic. She can't really make sense of what's happening. And so this friend, she reaches down and she picks up a flashlight. She turns it on and she aims the light at Simone, illuminating her head. And when this friend sees Simone's head, she starts to scream. Seconds later, the rest of the counselors that had been sleeping out were awake and they were rushing Simone, who was now shaking and vomiting, over to one of the staff vans. And then 15 minutes later, they had driven her to the emergency room. It would turn out After Simone had finally fallen asleep and she began having that really intense dream about a crown of thorns being dug into her scalp, well, in reality, something was digging into her scalp and it was kind of manifesting itself in her dream. And what was digging into her scalp was the jaws of a fox. This fox had snuck into the campsite and walked right up behind Simone and just started eating her head. And amazingly, it did not wake Simone up right away. And so this fox got 20 or so serious bites out of Simone's head before she shot up and scared it away. And so almost certainly what Simone saw running away from her in that quick moment was the fox. Doctors were able to save Simone and stitch her head back together. And they were even able to hide all of the scars in her hairline. So you can't even see them. But despite her being physically okay today, psychologically, this was a very traumatizing event. Not only does she refuse now to go into any forest, whether it's day or night, but she also periodically still gets phantom pains in her scalp that feels like the fox is biting her head all over again. So that's going to do it, guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please... Shit. Oh. I was... I honestly was thinking, like, she was going to wake up and then in the tree line, she was going to see these two men. I was like, oh, yeah. It's paranormal. Something weird is going on. Oh. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.